but what, what, what fascinates many of us, I think, about, about Ballymaloo is how they, the, the, the vision, the prescience, how they've sustained this extraordinary empire that they've built, which is now into its fourth generation. The books, the TV shows, the gardens, the, the, the restaurants, just their general, and, and, and the, the, their, their, their worldwide respect that people have for them, for what they've achieved, and also their vision for this country, which is no small thing because we need a vision. Uh, we need to talk about organic farming. I was telling them earlier, Rory and Edward, you know, that my husband was in farming at one stage and I really was very anxious to get him to convert to organic farming. This is about 30 years ago. And I mentioned milking goats. <laughs> and the whole thing went out the window. That was the end of organic farming. But I knew I was right. <laughs> the Allens are still talking about it. Rory is still talking about it. This is their vision for this country. Amid all the other activities that are, go- that are going on, the books that are uh, in the shops, the books that are coming into the shops, nothing is stopping. And they have so many interesting and important things to say. But we're going to start by setting this pair in context, because they are siblings, as you all probably know. Um, Doreen is the eldest of a family of nine. Rory was the second youngest? Yes. Um, years between us. Uh, years. <laughs> actually, a generation. Actually, 13 <laughs> years between them. Yes. Uh, Rory turned 60 last year. Uh, so what I want to do is set them in context and how this... How, the, the, the person they both go back to constantly in conversation is their mother. And I think it's very important to render homage to the women uh, with all due respect, Rory. My life has been a series of strong women. A series of strong women, <laughs> uh, absolutely. But to go back to the, to the woman, uh, to, to their mother, to Myrtle Allen. So let's begin with your home life, mm. at home with your mother, who was widowed at the age of 37 when you were only 14, Doreen. That's right, yeah. So can you just tell me a little bit about that and how she managed? She ran a business and she also inculcated you all with this extraordinary style and philosophy. Tell us a bit. Um, well, again, as you say, I'm the eldest of nine children, and um, Mummy really had never... Uh, when my father died, he died of lung cancer. He was a, quite a heavy smoker at a time when people didn't quite realise how serious um, smoking was and so on. And when uh, Daddy died, Mummy had never had anything to do with the business or anything like that. She looked after us all the time. There was always cooking going on in our house. And, the, you know, there was a garden and we had hens and all that kind of thing. So that was our, uh, that was our norm, basically. And then she... Mummy and Daddy adored each other. Actually, it was one of those rare enough marriages, I think, that really were made in heaven. I was 14 when my father died, and I never really remember a a crossword between them, and he never left the house without giving her a hug. I mean, really terrific example uh, to all of us. But um, basically, there was always cooking going on, Rory, in the house, wasn't there? Um, There was. um, Yeah, always. I have no recollection of my father, because I was very young when he died. But... um, uh, yeah, there was always cooking because there were people to be fed, basically. But Mummy um, had to cook to feed us, but she genuinely loved cooking. And uh, I, I'm sure she got great pleasure from us enjoying uh, the food and never leaving the table without asking, I'm sure, incredibly irritatingly, what the next meal might contain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of awful question that would drive you over the edge. But, um, and also, uh, you firmly believe that um, uh, she was interested in, in food because she felt it was our health, which, of course, food is your health. And, um, and, but she genuinely loved cooking. And also, um, she was a good cook. Now, those two things don't always collide. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, and she cooked really beautifully. And she was sort of organised. Yeah. It was just... It, was, it wasn't chaotic yeah. at all. And at she, was, she was also a very stylish woman, which, mm. has, which I must say it's, it's come out in all sorts of ways uh, from your family, Doreen and Rory. But also, if I may mention your book, which is currently in the shops, The Joy of Food, which talks about, even when you're eating alone, a little bunch of flowers, mm. yeah. Um, yeah. how yeah. you set 
things up to be stylish in such a simple way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm taking lessons from this. Yeah, well, yeah. I think my mother, my mother's mother and father always ate on their own in the evening when their children were gone to bed. Yeah. And mummy and daddy, I believe, ate on their own. You probably remember this. I don't, yeah. when everybody, when all the children were gone to bed. And there was always flowers on the table and there were flowers in the house. And mummy had lovely things. There wasn't a great deal of money, but she had lovely things. And she was always, from an early age, she'd say to us, you know, look at that, isn't that beautiful, that tree or that bowl or that horse or dog or whatever it was. So, you know, I suppose that, that trickles. And then in, in a family of nine, th that impression or those impressions uh, fall more heavily and imprint, I think, more heavily on some of the siblings than others. But I was definitely um, uh, coloured and moulded by her love of beautiful things, either utterly simple in nature or something more uh, beautiful in man-made. Well, can I just tell you that, uh, Rory just told me this, that he's staying in this lovely little B&B &B in the town. And what did you bring with you? <laughs> I brought my own coffee for breakfast. <laughs> no, no, what else? Pardon? You brought the coffee, what, you brought something else. Well, I brought a, a little Shanagari pottery jug, the coffee in it and a sieve. I because I'd say his landlady coffee. is delighted with him. I mean, the first cup of coffee. What are you going to do? I don't think anybody else feels that way about their first cup of coffee every morning. Yeah, oh. no, no, I don't think there's anything unusual. And at have all you about said that. that? It's the most delightful, lovely place to stay over Joyce's gorgeous pub in the village, and they've just opened some rooms. And I'm sure the coffee is delicious, but I'm just a little eccentric about my okay, coffee. Okay, the coffee, I'm sure, is delicious. <laughs> now, let's go back to Ballymaloo and what exactly it comprises right now, because I want people here who might not know to know the extent of what you achieved there. So you uh, moved in, Darina, at what age? Well, I, I came from a hotel school in Dublin uh, at, I, I suppose I was 18, I think I was 18 or something, 18, 19, that was in the 15th of June in 1986, I think I came to Bamley, oh, no, no, yeah, and, oh no, no, not 1960, oh, uh, it's what happens when you're 73, <laughs> there we are, um, but uh, yeah, and I, you know, I'd heard about Myrtle and came down, but actually when you say all the things we've achieved at Bamley, we're a very big family, mm. and they're like, at this point, uh, of course, we're all building on what Myrtle and Ivan created originally and uh, there are all these other now about uh, 14, 15 little mini businesses all connected to food in some way all financially independent of each other but doing some of them quite big I mean obviously the Ballymaloo Relish which my sister-in-law Yasmin does is you know, a very, quite a big business, Cully and Sully and all of those. But lots of us have, you know, small little businesses connected to either the farmer's markets or, you know, woodwork or there are all kinds of uh, different things. So, um, and everybody is... It's some way it's connected to the food, to the soil, to farming, to growing, or some. That's there's the masses thing. of opportunity in that food. Constant thread, <laughs> a constant th thread of, 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 of local slow food, organic, which moves me very deeply for all the little I know about food, but the fact that that's now become so important and was so prescient. I mean, Darina, what was there? Now, can, please, all false well, modesty aside, what was there when you, well, when when, you arrived in Ballymaloo? Well, you see, when I, um, when I was at, I, I went to boarding school uh, to Dominican nuns in Wicklow, and uh, basically at that time, they, and Dominicans were always considered to be, and were indeed, wonderful visionary nuns. So they were encouraging us, us girls to have a career uh, basically at that time to either do law, medicine, the science or something or other. And at that stage, you know, this is a long time ago. Look at Rory looking at me. Uh, I think you're all hoping for a fight. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway so basically... <laughs> You know, um, I just wanted to, um, I mean, many women didn't really have a career. And to tell you the truth, I had absolutely no ambition when I was at secondary school. I just thought I need to find some sort of job to pass the time until I find a nice chap, preferably with some money, and I will have, you know, a few cute little kids and go on picnics and all of that. That was the total height of my ambition. And I'm not making that up, actually. That was true. Uh, but anyway, uh, so then what to do, what to do? And I, all I want, knew anything about was... Uh, was uh, cooking or food or we had a Kerry cow, you know, those sort of things. And I just thought, well, I, I'd I want to cook. I really want to cook and or uh, otherwise uh, to, uh, to, to grow. And so the nuns, I mean, one of these wonderful nuns whose name I won't mention now, 
um, because she was wonderful and she drew herself up to her full height. She was quite small and she said, well, you're never going to need that, my dear. You know, you'll be a career woman and you'll have somebody to cook for you and to grow for you and all of that. And so anyway, I persisted. All the others, you know, went on to do wonderful things. And then they said, well, that's it. You have to either do uh, hotel management or a degree in horticulture. So anyway, I applied to Calbury Street and uh, in Dublin, only got in on the second uh, calling because the first time, I mean, this is apropos of nothing, but anyway, it might cheer some people up. At the first time, there was an entrance exam and there, there was a, an IQ test, okay? Now, actually, you may not know, I'm not Roy, so she's not going to tell this story. Uh, but anyway, Rude. there's actually a technique in doing, well, I, thought, I think there's a technique in doing an IQ test. But anyway, because you have to put all those little triangles into boxes and runs. I hadn't a notion. Anyway, I failed that completely. And then somebody actually fortunately dropped out and they took me in on the second thing and then at the end of all of that sorry I'm not going to go into a big long winded thing but anyway there was the next dilemma women were, men were chefs you know and women could not get a job in a top kitchen and all I wanted to do is I wanted to continue to cook and what most of the people in my class would have aspired to having done this hotel management course you'd uh, get try to get a job in the Hibernian or the Russell or the Shelburne or something in Dublin you'd have as an assistant manager okay and you'd have a little you'd have a uniform little badge which would say you're assistant manager with your name on it and you'd be all important and everything and for me that was another name for slave and uh, basically I, I, I just wanted to cook but I couldn't there was no question of getting into a top kitchen and you never know in your life what's a tiny little thing that can change the course of the rest of your life and I one of the um, despairing tutors met, met me, senior tutors met me in the corridor one day and said, why, you've no, why haven't you got a job yet? Everybody else in your class has a job. And, you know, why can't you get a job as assistant manager? I said, I really want to cook. And I had a fixation about making ice cream and about souffles and terrines. All these sort of things sounded so exotic. And learning more about fresh herbs, because I knew what parsley was and thyme and maybe chives. And anyway, she told me I was far too fussy uh, but she said, funny, I was at a dinner party the other night and they were talking about this woman down in Cork, this farmer's wife who's opened a, rest this, opened a restaurant out in their own house, out in the country, miles out in the country. And, and she writes the menu every day and they have, um, they have a jersey herd. I think they make their own ice cream and they, uh, they're near the sea there. And, and um, you know, they just, she, just, she just cooks and writes the menu every day depending on what's in the garden and what's in the comes in from the boats in Ballycotton. Now, this was all in incredulous tones because this is at a time when, many of you before you were born, when a restaurant opened or whatever, they might write the menu, it might be the same 10 years later. So the idea of actually writing the menu every day was considered to be incredibly amateurish. So did you just take off to Ballymaloo? So then, uh, then um, she couldn't remember her name. She came back a few days later and said to me, look, this is the woman, write to her. So the, the name of the piece of paper was Myrtle Allen. So as I say, you never know the tiny thing that can... I wrote to her and she wrote back a sweet letter saying, I have children your age. <laughs> 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 so anyway, the rest is... As so said, the rest is 100% understanding about it. But, but that's... And that was it. That and, was it. And then I came actually... very Because I, I don't think... When I came to Ballymaloo, I just loved it from the moment I, I uh, went, came in. And Myrtle thought me, I don't want to be misunderstood at this, but she really thought me almost the opposite of everything I'd been taught in a formal hotel school. But, uh, and she totally, although Carl Bruce, she don't get me wrong, was really, really good and very wonderful in many ways, so many ways, but Myrtle had a different take on everything. She was totally, wasn't she, Rory? She just did, did her own thing at a time. She didn't look to see what the other chefs were doing. Give me an example there, Doreen, of something well, she might have done differently. Uh, I mean, or if you well, she had complete her instincts, own... mm. really, yeah. about food. And, and, uh, and some people are instinctive about food, and some people are natural cooks, that, that expression that's sometimes used. But her, uh, she, if she thought it was rice, you know, an ingredient, uh, to put it together, another ingredient, she did it. She wasn't coloured by what the grand hotels or the grand restaurants were doing. Uh, so to that end, for example, the menu was written in English from day one. And the menu in the Russell, or before my time, um, and places <laughs> of that ilk, um, were all written in French. Yeah. Completely yeah. in French. Yeah. And she yeah. put on, you know, fresh <laughs> mackerel, cabbage, carrageen, 
You know, there was restaurant food at that time, and there was home cooking, and they did not cross over. So whatever was best, whatever was most delicious, Myrtle would put it on. And do you remember, Rory, the little children, local children, still happens, coming to the kitchen door, some sand there, some sand there, and they'd have a little tin can of blackberries or sloes or wild mushrooms or watercress or something, and, say, and then Myrtle would come out and... She would um, give them, buy them from them, give them pocket money, their little eyes would be shining. And of course, and she'd of course incorporate all that forage food into the menu. And I mean, this is what is 50 something years but ago. The cooking was a sort Whatever of Whatever was best. Really, yeah. on sort of really good, beautiful country house cooking. So you had the garden, uh, you had a little bit of money to do shopping for some spices and things like that, you had um, a liquor cupboard. Um, and it was based on what you might have expected to get if you were staying in a very good grand or fairly grand house. And, and, and those houses were full of generations of travelled people who'd been to India, who'd been to the continent. So all these little snippets of information and techniques and things coloured to a certain extent what she did and how she thought about food. And she also started buying the books of the great food writers. And this was a time when there were very, very few cookery books published. Um, and she read those uh, and, and studied them because she was always searching for better technique and more skills and to be better at doing something. But at the base of it all was an utter, total instinct uh, for food, to the point where um, you know you actually had the confidence to put on something as simple as a tomato and basil salad, which seems perfectly acceptable nowadays. But the idea of of, of a starter of of tomatoes, a little seasoning, olive oil, and basil, was was pretty novel then, and uh, you know, so it was a completely instinctive and a real belief. Also, she was a farmer's wife, so that really affected how she felt about food and how. Uh, how people who grow f grew food should be repaid for it, and um, and the respect were given for food. And the other thing, sorry, it's a very long answer, is which really affected affected mummy's cooking at home as well. Uh, the, and the attitude to food was that she had lived through the war. You know, when an orange was a treat. Remember, mummy telling us, you know, when the oranges would come into the village, yeah. you'd go, you know, they'd go down to the shop, they'd get X amount of oranges. So all of that coloured, certainly my mother's cooking and Mrs. Allen's cooking. So it was frugal. Um, no but, waste. But no no waste, waste. Out but, of the question. But really, it's very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. But not faffy, but definitely sophisticated. Yeah. So, and, Darina, John, just, just to sort of establish where you took off here, when you arrived here and Myrtle was there and she was doing this amazing thing and you found your niche, you said, this is my tribe, this is mm, where, this is yeah, where I, I, I want yeah. to be. Where, I was is, like a sponge listening I'm to I'm sure yeah, you were. Yeah. Um, but at some, but, but, I mean, I remember Irish farming back in the old days and basically a lot of people were eking a living out of the soil. It mm. wasn't easy. You were in a part of Cork, which was neither popular nor profitable at that time, I would think. Um, you were, I mean, the idea of starting any kind of a business in that location must have been risible to some of the people who were hearing about it, including the woman who informed you about Myrtle in the first place. So what did you do there? I mean, you obviously got moving at a heck of a pace at some point. Yeah, but um, I, just want, I just want to put one other thing into context. When Myrtle was doing all of this um, and serving the food of our local food and farmers and everything proudly and setting up a network of food producers around her. Local was a derogatory term in the thing. It was not the idea of serving local food. I mean, you'd expect to get it for less because it was local. So just to, to put that into context. But actually, the cooking school, this is no great thing. The cooking school was born out of desperation. I mean, I, I don't use that word like, but desperation's a brilliant thing. When your back is to the wall, it's amazing what you can do. Remember, I had no ambition, remember that? <laughs> I had no intention of going... Hard to uh, believe, yeah. anyway. <laughs> yes. uh, but basically, uh, so, uh, in a way, so anyway, uh, we were farming. My husband is a horticulturalist. In the end, actually, I ended up marrying a horticulturist and living close to the sea, which I'd craved uh, being brought up in a little village in the Midlands. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, so the, at the late 70s, early 80s, there was, uh, you'll probably remember... We there was a perfect storm for us. Uh, there was a, a very bad recession again. Uh, there was oil crisis, 25% inflation. We were heating five acres of greenhouses with oil. We were in, it's a big, it was a big horticultural business, exporting and everything. We went into the EU, of course, in 
1973, this tidal wave of regulations came in, and, and then the whole cheap supermarkets came on stream, and the whole cheap food policy kicked in. Now, any of you are farming or whatever know that instead of getting more, a little bit more for your produce every year, and, wa and uh, wages shot up as well. Uh, so suddenly, uh, what had been a very profitable business employing over 100 people, a horticultural unit, in East Cork, just outside the village of Shanagari, uh, suddenly became, was hemorrhaging money. We had four small children, and uh, we had been, every time we went to sell something, we then started to, to, to uh, supply the supermarkets, and we could see that that wasn't any solution. So anyway, uh, I remember Timmy coming back one morning from having delivered stuff into a, uh, apples into Cork and being more and more despondent because the arrangement that had been agreed hadn't been kept to. And he just came in and he said to me, I don't care if I have to crawl on my knees. I'm never doing that again. We have to find a different way to earn a living. And so as young, as many people have now, as a young married couple with four children and properly in danger of losing the roof over our heads, we had to think, what talents have we and what resources have we between us to earn a living in a different way. And of course, we were on a farm already growing something. So anyway, I could cook a, a, a little. And at some stage, the penny had dropped. If I had some friends to supper, we'd have a little simple supper. And they might say, oh, that, they might say occasionally, that was delicious, you know, whatever. And, and they'd say, how did you do that? And I'd say, well, I just did this and this and this. And then it, at some stage, a bit slow, the penny dropped, but it wasn't <laughs> as obvious you to maybe monetize it. <laughs> and maybe that I could give little cooking classes. And actually, again, I built on what Myrtle did there because in the winter in Balmenu, when the rooms you know, weren't so busy, Myrtle started to do cooking classes. She may have been the first person to do the cooking classes, Roy, too. And anyway, I would help her and weigh up the things and this, that and the other for her. And then, of course, Rory talks about coming from a long line of mad women. Indeed, we do. Myrtle decided she'd open a restaurant in Paris, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, did you know about that? La Ferme Londres in Paris. And she wanted that to because she was so convinced of the quality of Irish produce at a time when we all had the biggest inferiority complex about what we had here in Ireland. We were sure that what was in the UK or America or whatever, many of you won't remember when that it had to be better than what we had. So she wanted this restaurant to be a show, a shop window for Irish food and Irish produce in Paris, because she could see the reaction of the French people when they came to Balmaloo. They loved Irish food. And what was I saying, Rory, and I went off we on that were, tangent? What I want to do is come back to the cookery school, which it seems to me oh, yes. laid the ground oh, yeah, no, for all that, that came Martel after. Started, um, she started doing uh, the cooking class, and then she was doing the restaurant in Paris, so she couldn't continue on the following year. People were asking for more cooking classes, and so she said, why don't you do it? And I said, I can't do it. Nobody knows about me. You know, and you're, you're, you, you're the attraction and so on. But I came back to the desperation. I basically, I thought, well, I'll have a go. And whatever one does, you know, if you can manage to do it the first time, get over that, you get a bit of confidence, you survive that, and then you go on from there. So Rory, that's where it started. I realised while reading the other day that you were all of 24 when you co-founded the cookery school with, with Tarina. That's right. I, what were I, you thinking? I don't know. God knows. Um, but, no, he's asked himself that a lot of times. <laughs> uh, because when I finished secondary school, I went to university to study law. But I spent most of my time at the races anyway. It wasn't for me, the law. And I faffed around with a couple of other things uh, for a few years. And then my mother suggested I go down to Ballymaloo and work on reception for a summer to find myself. Uh, <laughs> I'd come back with some sort of academic plan in hand. And I didn't. I haven't. Uh, but at the end of the summer, I, so I didn't know what I was going to do, so I asked Mrs. Allen, could I go into the kitchen unpaid, my word, uh, until Christmas? Because I want, there were specific dishes I wanted to learn how to cook. Because we ate delicious food at home, but my mother did not make hollandaise sauce or bernaise sauce, things like that. And I felt that for my life to be somewhat complete, I needed those things in my life. <laughs> so I needed to learn how to cook What a strange young lad. <laughs> Uh, to cook them, and um, so I did. But then, within you know, within a week of being in the kitchen, and you, know, you found the, your yeah, niche. Absolutely, the penny dropped immediately. And the two of you set this business up, um, as I say, in this very remote part of Cork. And the work rate must have been unbelievable. You were Especially wrestling busy, with yeah. this printer, which you you still curse. <laughs> Just yes. I don't know how many years later. Um, and so, so 
it went on from there. Yeah, I did one school start first. It was Drina and I, and I think a part time secretary, and one other wonderful girl called Florrie Bulger, who's now Florrie Colon. But anyway, 30, 40 years, whatever, many years later. Still with us. And so we did it. We just had um, a group of, a small group of uh, residential students for the first 12 weeks, eight or nine or something like that. And then we do night classes, two nights a week as well, uh, uh, look, night classes. And then we'd, the week would go on normally. On Saturdays, I would do the shopping in Cork um, for things we had to get, you know, that weren't on the farm or locally. And then also the, um, the recipes, we used to re- print the recipes on an old-fashioned Gestetner machine. Probably doesn't mean to anybody here because it's so <laughs> ancient. But any, it was the filthiest, most cantankerous piece of machinery ever you describe yourself as cranky. I, I see, often see in but dispatches. Um, you like to print you and the printer. <laughs> yeah, no, unless I have my own coffee. But anyway, so we did, really what I'm saying is we did a bit of everything. We did everything, really. Yeah. And then it just kind of, and then uh, Dorina would, uh, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but she'd, uh, she'd ask someone like Claudia Roden or Matter Jaffrey or some of these extraordinary, iconic, overused word, but truly uh, relevant in the case of those two ladies, had to come and cook at school and teach at the school. So gradually, this gave gravitas, I think. Is that the right yeah, word totally, to what we yeah. were doing? Yeah. And, and sort of respectability and, of course, to get a bit more notice in the press and all of that. And also, it was teaching us to teach, you know, us, because, you know, as teachers as well. So, so it just kind of went on from there, really. And we were, you know, we did it... I'm going to say beautifully, that's, I shouldn't say that, but it was really, we were really careful. And, and it we minded, had to work. And we minded about what we did. Didn't it, Rory? It just had to work. There was no question of it not uh, working because yeah. of the... Of the roof the, depended on it. Exactly. And uh, also, um, we... We also took, if if we took every opportunity, Rory was saying, to learn and to add to our knowledge and to and to share that. Then, but any time I would go to lunch, save up, go to London, spend a few days in London. Before I went, I would ring, you know, several restaurants, top restaurants, and say, you know, I wonder could I come into the kitchen for a day or two and learn from you? I've, uh, we have a cooking school in Ireland, and because I was in Ireland, there was no competition, so that was fine. So normally they would, uh, you know, uh, invite me in. And people, a lot of the top restaurants and chefs, they were so generous uh, with, uh, with, with their information, yeah. weren't they, Rory? Yeah. When I finished cooking at, at Ballyboo House for a certain period of time, I said, well, you know, I'd worked through all of the various departments and... And you had to be to butcher, and you had to do do all of the different things. But I from didn't, scratch, did everything from scratch, was done from scratch. But I didn't scratch, feel yeah. that my education was complete by any stretch of the imagination. So when I went to uh, finished working in New House, I went to Arbus Lodge in Cork, which was a wonderful restaurant run by the Ryan family, which was regarded as being the great Irish restaurant of the time, Michelin star, all that sort of thing. And that was an amazing, very different experience from the relatively homespun evolution of the kitchen in Ballymaloo to the kitchen at Arbutus of Lodge, Lodge, which was run in, on much more classic French lines. And then over the years, then I, I went and worked in, in, in very good restaurants in, uh, in England and in France and in Europe and in America, just, just trying to get better, to get better. Coming to the present, I suppose, I mean, because, because we now have an idea of what it took, you know, why, what, what, what impelled you. It was sheer desperation, as you say. And you, we're now, as I say, into the fourth generation with the two of you still absolutely running this. Um, but loving what we're doing every But day. loving what you're doing. Yeah. But also, I mean, I was saying to Rory the other day that my idea of hell is a kitchen. <laughs> um, and I, I, I feel that if I couldn't do what I'm doing, I, there's a lot of things I could do. I mean, I'd work in a bank, for example, or, I, you know, I, I, I'd be quite happy and lost. I could never imagine myself in a kitchen because of the sheer, enduring, almost drudgery of it. Now, you make it sound so creative and wonderful. I've seen Gordon Ramsay and I just think, oh God, <laughs> save us. He has so a the, lot to answer for, has I, I'm afraid Ramsay. he has. He's well but, able to cook, though. But yeah, it's also wonderful. very hot in there and, 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 and a lot of, a lot of sh- what seems to be a lot of shouting and huge amount of creativity going on in the middle of all this. And Rory, I can't... It's, it's the sustainability of it is what amazes me. The fact that you have sustained this for all these years. Well, there are different types of kitchens. The first thing is, I love cooking, and I, really, I just love cooking. It's my thing. But and and um, and in terms of 
Mr. Ramsey, there's a certain amount of theatrical um, arranging going on, I would say, <laughs> prior, prior to the shooting of his shows. But in my experience, the very best kitchens are quiet and calm and civilised, well, only the ones I've worked in, and really good places to be in, actually. And, and this was really important. And it was part of the thing, I think, that as a young, slightly lost 18 or maybe over 19 year old, whatever I was when I went into the kitchen based on greed rather than professional aspirations, that to discover that I could do something and within a few hours of starting the process get a result which meant something. And that's one of the things that's always attracted me about cooking and what I, if someone says to me, I might cook or whatever, and I say, you know, there are reasons, you know, why you might or why you might not, apart from being able to feed yourself is really important. But, but it's that, you know, you get a result very quickly. And, and also the thing about cooking is, um, I, and it also relates to teaching, you have the opportunity every day, sometimes twice a day or more, to give pleasure to people. And that's a ferocious drug. <laughs> you know, it yeah. really is. And yeah. it's just wonderful to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, how do you do this in terms of being a family? Um, you two, I don't know if you fight like cats when, when there's <laughs> no company. You should have been in the car around knocked over you. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean... Do when, <laughs> when Doreen's phone was giving her one set of directions... <laughs> My I was phone, on Google and so was he and there were totally different my directions. My phone was giving another set of directions. Doreen's was going to get us here five minutes quicker. <laughs> I was I losing kept repeating. my mind. <laughs> so no, we don't fight. Ah. <laughs> and he loves do doing the, the television programme with me. He's ready to stab oh, me during the thing. Well, it looks very calm, I have <laughs> to oh, say. No, we, I love I, it. I have the best fun ever. <laughs> now, just tell me, I mean, how do you, you, you are still maintaining a brand in spite of all these separate marvellous components that you have in the business. You're maintaining this Ballymaloo brand, which is almost priceless at this stage. Now, how do you do that on a practical level? Do you have weekly strategy meetings? Well, in what do you do? Yeah. Oh, she laughed. <laughs> in terms of the cooking school, it's pretty structured, really. Yeah. And, and certainly, at one point, I was very involved with Ballymaloo House with the hotel. I was head chef there for four years and joint general manager. And we always started off every Monday morning with a meeting. And it was Mrs. Allen and somebody to take minutes. And then Hazel Allen and, and, and another head of the department. And that was it. And, and we do that really more or less at the yeah. cookery school. Do I you? Mean, yes, we do, yeah. And, um, and, you know, there are things that I'm good at doing. What's and that? there are things that Doreen is good. No, that's not the point. That, <laughs> there are things that are lots of people within the operation that are good at doing. And it's We're different talents. You've just got to import, yeah. Yeah, you've yeah, got to, totally. that's got to well, be recognised. Well, okay, is one of you good at keeping the peace? <laughs> we all Keeping do our piece. bit towards that role. Oh, don't that's such a diplomatic answer. And no, overall, really, it's pretty no, good. I, 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 I'll just, it will just uh, yeah. walk away, and five minutes later, it's fine. If Dreen and I have an altercation, which is hardly ever, it is extremely swift, and it's over as swiftly, and it's only ever about something that really matters to the business, and about something that matters to our, our guests, our students. We never fight about anything else, really. Uh, but it's very quick and it's over. And yeah, that's it. Okay, I, 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 I wish we had another hour. But, but and, and I, there's so much more I have to talk about that I want you to talk about. Um, we, we, let's look at the past year and a half because we are running out of time and skipping over things that I really wanted to talk about in more depth. But it, the, the, the past year and a half has been an absolute challenge for people, mm. especially in hospitality. How has that been, Darina? Has it been a drain on your mental and physical energy? Um, well, it has to a certain extent, but I'm, I've always been, and Roy's the same, very much at last half full person. So I, and I'm sort of, uh, as we both are, an ideas person. So I'm, I'm used to, uh, to, to, if one door closes, see why the other door is, and so on. So we did a lot of this, we know lots of new words now, don't we? Uh, pivoting, we did a lot of that. So basically... <laughs> Uh, and when the first lockdown came, we had to stop a 12-week course in, you know, several, uh, seven or eight weeks through it or whatever. And the students were devastated. Anyway, that was it. We had to stop. So there were two things you could continue with. One was food and the other was, you know, pharmacy or medicine or whatever. And so we had a small, always had a small farm shop. We, the school is in the middle of a farm. It's a 100-acre organic farm. And we produce a lot of different types of vegetables. And we have a, a little Jersey herd and we have some 
chickens and pigs and all the rest of it. But anyway, so people could come and uh, we sold the produce from the farm uh, in this little shop beside the, the school. And sub then suddenly we increased the size of that, doubled the size of that. So that because local people, as you remember, we were only allowed to go within five kilometers or whatever. And so, uh, so that we were literally fed the local parish and community with, and also there's a bread, so that we make bread every day and the eggs and all that. So that was one thing. And then if you don't mind, the, uh, the farmer's markets, which we're very involved with, were actually suddenly closed down overnight uh, in the first lockdown. And so the farmers and food producers who were selling at the farmer's market suddenly found themselves with nowhere to sell. They couldn't, they, you know, the hens kept laying, the pigs kept getting fatter, the vegetables kept growing, and suddenly what were they Shocking. to do with it? It was absolutely appalling. Uh, and so anyway, we then um, uh, opened a, a branch and did it two days a week, actually, of some neighbor food. I hope you all know about neighbor food. It's an online farmer's market, actually, in fact, started by Spell a... Spell that for me, Doreen. Neighbor food. food. Neighbor food, okay. Neighbor food. Look it up if you don't. So it's an online farmer's market. Actually, it was started by a pasture of ours called Jack Crotty, quite the young entrepreneur. And so people, so then the local, the local farmers and food producers who had been selling at the farmer's market were able to, to put up the, all their produce online and the customers then could ring in their order, pay online, the farmers paid within three days and they would come and collect it at a set, they deliver the food, the producers and the, at a certain time and the uh, and the customers would come and collect at a certain time. We did two of those a week. It was crazy busy. So we were able to, some of our staff, we would employ oh, at the cooking school. Now, this is the cooking school in the farm and gardens, about 50-something people year-round. Some of them furloughed, a couple of them, but anybody who wanted work stayed on. All the gardeners and, and uh, the, uh, on the farm and everything, they stayed on because they had to plant seeds. This was the 13th of of March, wasn't it, they closed down. They had to plant seeds for future harvests. And so the teachers who were there then, because it's so important to hold on to the skills, that's the other thing. So the teachers uh, cooked lots and lots of things for the farm shop, which we doubled in size with two neighbor foods a week. And uh, so then we were able to keep so many of our staff on. And then the teachers, when they weren't cooking, they were down sowing seeds with the gardeners And as I well. needn't tell you that Doreen also wrote another book in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> which is coming out next month and which is going to be called... Well, the, cook, the, um, the working title was always uh, like, uh, you know, it started with 20 recipes and then 50 uh, uh, recipes that no kid should lose, leave school without. Well, my publishers were appalled at that as a title because apparently kid is, did you know this is non-PC? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So now it's called something very innocuous like The Way to Cook. A hundred recipes that no, everybody should know how to do or something. Anyway, it's being published in actually the beginning yeah, of September. But, but the woman who, was, who had no ambition. I mean, isn't this <laughs> incredible? In the middle of all this, she writes a book. Also... No, but that's really... Because yeah. in a way, this is, the, this is a book I've really... I know I say this every time, and who on earth needs another about to read on cookbook? But anyway, this one I really want, uh, basically... I hope I see, before I hang up my apron, I, I hope I see cooking re-embedded in the national curriculum, cooking and learning how to grow. And that's so important. Yeah, it's so, that yeah, it really is. Yeah. So this, this book is aimed to a great extent yes. at that. Yeah, yeah. And Rory, I actually, long before I talked to you this week, I actually picked up your book a few weeks ago, The Joy of Food, simply because it's beautiful. And my sister got it for a birthday present in the meantime. Um, and it is beautiful. And he is an essayist, an illustrator, and he's just an all-around around Renaissance man. <laughs> and this book actually is a way of getting to know Rory as well as looking at some really fabulous food that is achievable, which is one of his favourite words I discovered. Now, just, I just want to ask, talking about pivoting, um, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of especially young people, but also seasoned restaurateurs and um, uh, cafe owners pivot in, yeah. uh, towards the horse boxes and yeah, the containers food. and the takeaways and everything. Right. And do you think this is... Will aspects of that carry on, Doreen? And I hope, I know you hope they will, but what will work? Well, I hope that all those food trucks, which add so much colour to our lives and everything, I really hope that, uh, that they will continue. What do you think, Rory? I think, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, I think they will continue because, I mean, where would we be in, in, in wonderful bars today without 
the, the food trucks out here and it's just Absolutely. glorious. Absolutely. And, and quality will always out. So there will undoubtedly be a rate of attrition. There will be converted horse boxes going cheap in a couple of months' and time. And horses back in. Are going H- cheap. Horses in a horse box. One um, of the rarest um, things to see in a horse box now is a but, horse. But, but, but quality will out. And it, it makes, you know, it, yeah, because now we drink better coffee, you know, uh, and we want a good cup of coffee. And now Never know, quite as good as the one you bring yourself, Rory. <laughs> now, we know you, now we're all happy to wait for five minutes for a cup of coffee. I mean, five years ago, we would be, what's, you know, you know. So I think they will. I think they will. And also because... It's a curious thing because you can say there's a growing interest in food and then you, you, you think, actually, is there really a growing interest in food? Is there just an interest in, in, growing, in looking at cooking shows and, and, and things like that? But, um, and I sometimes say that, you know, as generations now know much more about, you know, the words involved in cooking. Um, but this goes back to Doreen's point, really, was that, you know, by the time I was 10 or 12, I, I could cook completely cook, you know, in terms of sustaining myself. I could I've put a roast chicken in the oven or whatever. I don't think I was particularly unusual, really. I think all of us could have really. And that was skills, uh, you know, skills just picked up at home, just watching what mommy was doing in the kitchen and, and in, encouraged to be somewhat involved. But the economic model has changed completely. So back then, you know, most, uh, certain, a lot of families could sustain one person working and one person, a person at home, you know, doing you know making the home work nowadays that's not possible as an economic model both people need to be out earning to make the balance sheet balance so the notion that you you learn how to cook at home is over generally that's why it has to be back in the schools i mean i would love to see a a a subject and i'm not the first person to say this this is a a thought very much uh suggested by Alice Waters from Chez Panisse in Berkeley, California, you know, one of the great original thinkers in terms of food. But that would, there would be an academic subject, and I think it should be called the table, but related to food, which would involve practical Teach cooking. Teach the kids to cook, Dorena. The kids. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but just you imagine what a subject, history, geography, art, you know, everything, you know, the ovoid shape of eggs, egg and dark motif, you know, you can go on forever, the, the importance of food, and it would be the most sensational subject, with as many points as maths and whatever. And thought through every subject, a geography class, a history class, everything would mention food exactly as, as Rory said. But actually, back to COVID for a second, so many things, different, you know, we had to pivot, we had to change our priorities in so many ways, but in a way, they, they think of thinking, being forced to think outside the box and uh, suddenly realising that there's so many things you can do. And also it was, uh, you know, it, such a leveller in many ways. People suddenly had lost their jobs and found that they could set up a stall or somewhere or other, or they could just do some little thing. Can I, so it, it made us, I think, many people much more entrepreneurial and just said, well, let's have a go. The other thing that we noticed at the, our farm shop was that because we're organic, sometimes things are a little bit more expensive they need to be because it costs more to produce and such etc but it was interesting how the penny seemed to have dropped with more and more people that actually maybe it's worth spending a bit more on that loaf of natural sourdough or those uh, those beautiful eggs or the raw milk or whatever because I, I think people could see that if they invested a bit more money in buying really fresh you know, nourishing, wholesome food that they actually need to spend less on meds and supplements. Do you actually think they saw that, Roy? Do you think yeah. people genuinely did see that? Is, is, yes. Is, yeah, is, that, is, that, is that, that a perception now that's real? Yeah. I think so, at certain levels, I'd say. I'd say it is, at certain levels it is. But the other thing is, um, uh, one of the things, because sustainability, well, it's central really to what we've always done, really, honestly. Uh, but, um, you know, the notion, and, and we're all told, you know, if we'd only stop wasting the 25 to 30 and food that we buy, that it would have a huge impact, which of course it would, right the way back along the chain on the environment. But the notion of lecturing people about that, but at the same time, not teaching them how to cook. The lot is no sense, because unless you know how to cook, you don't know how to use that thing in the back of your fridge. 
Do you know what I mean? Or is it safe to use even? You do know that. Paranoia the fear around of food, food is safety, a huge food problem. hygiene. Yeah. Fear People didn't used problem. to be afraid of their yeah, food. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the sense of smell is so, you know, if something smells right, it generally speaking is. Now that's a, don't quote me, that's not but but yeah, really, honestly. It say it again. That, 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 <laughs> If something smells right, it generally speaking it is. is. Um, but people have lost the, and it's not, and this is not a criticism, it's just that those sort of skill, I suppose you'd call it, or well, I don't know what it would have been called back in the day, it wouldn't have been called a skill. But anyway, you know, knowing that, looking into your fridge and, and what to do with the few bits and pieces that you can make something utterly delicious out of. So, so you, you, you know, if you're going to lecture people about wasting food, well, put cooking back into the, in, into the schools. And, and so yeah. that by the time you get to the stage where you're the person who looks into the fridge, you know what the hell is going on yeah. there and you know what to do with stuff. Well, well was, one of the things that my, my friend Patsy Murphy here w- was talking about yesterday was a piece by, is it today? Today's, yesterday, by Michael Viney in the Irish Times, where he was talking, writing about rewilding. You know, Michael is really one of the, one of the great environmentalists and was like Darina and the cooking and Myrtle, was at it long, long before it was popular or profitable. But yesterday he was writing about rewilding and the wildflower sowing that we're all getting into now. And apparently there's a group now that is tot-totting at some of these wildflowers <laughs> not being native. Oh, and oh we God. both agreed that we felt a little surge of annoyance about this. And Rory, I was asking you about this earlier, and you, what was your reply to this? Well, my reply to that is, I think, I mean, I guess what they're saying for sure but it's much more important that people might, it, to put something into the ground, to just get the bug. Grow you know, something. Just grow something. And then, you know, you become, I mean, you know, if you go into a kitchen, you don't start off making a souffle suisses. You, you start off learning how to boil an egg. Eventually, you'll get to the souffle suisses if you want to. I mean, I got a message a couple of years ago um, from a very nice lady, an email uh, saying that I'd written in one of my books, I'd suggested to people that they might dig up wild garlic in the wild and transplant a little of it into their garden. But the garlic I particularly remembered or I mentioned was the three-cornered leaf garlic, which is apparently invasive. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. Eat it. Eat our weeds. But, but anyway, so, and that was quite interesting because I'd never thought about that before. I just thought having a bit of wild garlic in your own garden, brilliant. Right, this, this, is when it, yeah. this is when it gets <laughs> exhausting. But, but, but so it's, <laughs> So it's a bit like it's a bit like that, isn't it? Yes, yeah. you know it is. I mean? It is, yeah. and you need to know something. Yes, you, need, you, yeah. you, you do need yeah. a little bit of knowledge. But I so agree with you that really, when you, there's, there's a little bug there with with people now. They recognise you don't manicure every blade of grass. Yeah. Yeah. Let some of it grow. But we also need to know how to manage it. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're actually really are running out of time now. I have so much. I wanted to talk to you in more depth about the about the organic, um, about how how disappointing. Our, our organic development is in this country, how even when I was a young one, it seemed to have great hopes, but it's still very small scale. It's, oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, if, I, if you could talk about a vision, if, it's a big word, isn't it? Uh, certainly, if I have one vision for Ireland, it is, I hope I live to see the day. I'm not hugely hopeful, but I would love to see the day when we have Ireland, the organic food island. What an opportunity. <laughs> For an island nation to be, uh, to be, and now, I mean, this may sound like pie in the sky. Obviously, the farmers would need an enormous support in terms of advice and in terms of, uh, of financial support and everything like that again. But what is everybody craving around the world? They're craving food they can trust. And uh, if it was for nothing else, leave climate change, all the other things out of it, but if it was for nothing else but the future prosperity of our farmers and our food producers, can you imagine what it would mean if people, if they, we could absolutely stand over everything that was produced in Ireland, we knew that it was going to nourish and, uh, and keep people healthy rather than doing them a damage. So, I mean, I would love to see Ireland, the organic food island, there are very few countries in the world that could do it, but oh, come on, all of you guys. <laughs> Get up, now. take up your pens. But we have to believe it could be done, and it could be done. But you would take a decade at least with it be try to transition. Anyway, there you are. That's Rory, your vision next now. <laughs> your vision, Rory. <laughs> oh, my, vision. Quick about it. <laughs> my vision is to hope to be cork in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I we don't, bypassed Mulder. I mean, I agree with what you just said. I don't think it's sort of grandiose as a vision, um, but I think that um, on the subject of organic, that 
uh, a, a part of that discussion has to be the sort of the quality of the food. Uh, and if you start to look at the statistics internationally and uh, the state of play as regards health of nations and um, health of young people and uh, increasing amount of, uh, of uh, allergies and intolerances and difficulties uh, with their eating and uh, there are some horrifying statistics, um, it, particularly in, rela in relation to the USA, where there's a prediction that by uh, 2030, one in three children will be, will be declared to be autistic. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find out why is that happening, and there is convincing science that relates it back to the food that people are eating. And then you've got, well, then you, the obvious question is to ask what is in the food that people are eating and what is causing the problem. So actually, as an economic model, the notion that an island space like Ireland, quite big, might become an organic island uh, is, if you started to do a balance sheet, it kind of could, it might actually make sense. And scalability, I mean, you now have 20,000 acre organic farms in England. They are, generally speaking, owned by people who can sustain yes, that sort yes, of, in, yes. in the interim, whatever. But it's the, the true cost of food and what is costing nations per capita per health, as distinct from the true, at uh, the cost of food, what it's costing the nations per, for a person to eat. There is mm. a vast difference yeah. in the two. And there's quite and a lot of it'll work. all come down to economics. Yeah, I, I com completely agree, Ryan. There's a lot of work that's been done indeed by the Sustainable Food Trust in the UK, Patrick Holden, and also in the US and some of the un uh, universities on the true, on what they call true cost accounting. Actually working out the true cost, because as you know, the whole emphasis in food for since the 50s really now has been to, produce the, to encourage the farmers to produce the maximum amount of food at the minimum cost. And in health terms and socioeconomic terms, you know, it's it certainly, some people would say it's been a total disaster. But basically, they reckon that, and there are figures to back this up, that, you know, uh, we pay for the, the, the price on the, on the shelf in the supermarket. But actually, what we're paying as taxpayers is five times more than that. Because we're paying to, uh, as taxpayers, we're providing the subsidies to back up the very intensive sustainable system, which, of course, at this stage, we can quite see um, there ne it can't, you know, it's, it can't go on as business as usual for all the reasons with climate change and everything else, to clean up the water, to fund the health service, and on and on and on. So five times the prices, whatever you go into your supermarket and you see something on the shelf, you think that's a great bargain, well, actually, you're, you're, we're being fooled that it's really five times more than that. That's the true cost. So this kind of accounting needs to be done and then see whether or not we could actually begin to think about Ireland, the organic food island. And uh, I, I'd be very surprised if it doesn't, as you say, Rory, uh, you know, considering the, the, the cost of the, the health service and all of the other things that were nobody, and at this stage, we, none of us can say we don't know the damage that, uh, you know, the chemicals and all the various other things are doing to our health. We can't say we don't know that. Okay, so, yeah. I'm really sorry. We've come to the end of the line, but there's one question that yeah. really one can never leave without asking. And it's a little bit sort of trivial compared to what we've just been discussing. But it's in light of your book, Rory, Master It, which is all about sort of top tips, like my friend tells me, it includes something. You never put the lid on while simmering stock. Did you know that? I didn't know that until this morning. Um, and Darina, of course, has written one of the great books called The Forgotten Skills of Cooking. So I'm going to ask you both to summarize in one sentence <laughs> okay. what your top yeah. tip is. You go first, Rory. You go first, Rory. Read the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Rory. A little tip on top Very of that. Very quickly, science. If you, be, I, be, I know we've no time left, but if you approach cooking from a purely scientific angle, utterly without emotion, do your shopping good quality. Bring them home, weigh the ingredients and measure them, like as if you were in the lab, putting together things, do things. Follow the instructions, you know, introduce them to the correct temperatures for the correct length of time. You will get a result. Simple as. Yeah. Okay, that's Absolutely. kind of boring, if I may yeah. say so. <laughs> well, I was looking for something a bit it's, more dramatic. <laughs> I know, it sounds, it sounds awfully cold, but your food, your food will be delicious. Darina, what about you? Can well, you save I'm this? actually going to agree with everything my brother says for once. And, but I'm all, and to really reiterate, put your energy into sourcing really wonderful raw material. So a, a little, it could be flowery potatoes, it could be a cabbage, you could just have it fresh. 
uh, as, uh, and, and, and just cook it simply. I mean, but if you start off with mass-produced, denatured food, then you have to be a magician to get it to taste good. Isn't that right, Roar? Do you agree with me? Yeah, I, every word. Every I word. I don't see how you ever fight, you two. <laughs> and it's, it has been... Okay. <laughs> You've heard, you've heard of Boutros Boutros Galli? I have. And people of that ilk. Who is Boutros Boutros Galli in your house? What? I, I asked this. Who is Boutros Boutros Galli in your house? Possibly track? me. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rory. I'm joking. I'm joking. Look, it has been a genuine pleasure. I don't often say that about interviewees, and journalists here in the audience will know they have their favourites, but this has been one of my absolute favourites. Thank you. Oh, talking thank to you. them on the Thank you, phone, darling. Talking to them beforehand. I've enjoyed every second of it. Thank and I hope so you much. have enjoyed. Oh. Rory O'Connor. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.